If you've ever watched a video about the stock market, you've likely heard the term NASDAQ, but it's often used in significantly different contexts. Sometimes, people are referring to an index like the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones. Other times, people are referring to a stock exchange similar to the NYSE or the London Stock Exchange. And in other cases, people are talking about a publicly traded company called the NASDAQ. Given all these different definitions, it's easy to write off the NASDAQ as just some gear in the financial markets. But the NASDAQ is actually the lifeblood of the biggest tech companies in the world, including Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Tesla, Nvidia, and Google. What's even crazier is that the NASDAQ is by no means a heritage player in the stock market. In fact, the NASDAQ wasn't even created till 1971. For perspective, the NYSE was founded in 1792. Despite this short history, the NASDAQ has become the king of the modern stock market. So here's exactly what the NASDAQ is and how it squashed legacy players to the top. Starting with the origins of the NASDAQ, we have the company behind everything. The story of the company itself dates back to the late 1960s when Wall Street was struggling to keep up with demand. This was because the 1960s was one of the most prosperous times in the US. The economy was booming, wages were skyrocketing, and GDP growth was through the roof. In fact, real GDP growth averaged 5% throughout the 1960s, and US payrolls increased by 32%. To top it all off, the US would literally reach the moon near the end of the decade, so the everyday American was feeling more confident than ever before, leading them to take a double with the stock market. This drove unprecedented amounts of volume into the NYSE. By the start of the 1970s, the average daily trading volume was 12 million shares per day. This might not sound like much compared to the billions of shares that are traded on a daily basis today. But given that the NYSE was only open for 5 hours per day in the early 1970s, we're talking about executing 667 shares every single second. While this was great for business, the NYSE had extreme difficulty handling all these trades. After all, they didn't get any help from computers, so they had to manually execute and keep track of every trade that took place. Seeing this rapidly compounding issue, the National Association of Security Dealers, or the NASD, decided to create an electronic stock market called the NASDAQ, or the National Association of Securities Dealers Automated Quotations. And this gave rise to the world's first electronic stock market on February 8, 1971. In the beginning, the NASDAQ wasn't exactly an electronic stock market per se, given that they didn't actually execute any trades electronically. Rather, they were more of a quotation service that allowed investors to electronically see the live prices of the various stocks listed on their platform. When it came to actually executing trades, however, this was still done manually. But it didn't take long for the NASDAQ to introduce electronic execution as well. Over the next few decades, the NASDAQ introduced one feature after another from automatically tracking daily volume to the electronic execution of trades. Given the relative ease of the NASDAQ stock exchange, a lot of investors and especially traders flocked towards the exchange. By the early 1980s, the NASDAQ accounted for 37% of the entire US securities market, and it wasn't long before they crossed the 50% mark. But despite the extreme popularity of the NASDAQ, it was never that respected. In fact, the NASDAQ was often referred to as an OTC market or an over-the-counter market. If you're not familiar with this term, it basically refers to the trading of stocks that aren't listed on the major stock exchanges such as the American Stock Exchange or the NYSE. The term OTC is generally used with a negative connotation as it's closely related to the trading of garbage penny stocks. Despite this negative association, some up-and-coming tech companies like Microsoft and Apple who understood the power of electronic trading start to embrace the NASDAQ. This didn't change the perception of the NASDAQ overnight, but it did cause investors to take the NASDAQ more seriously. After all, Microsoft and Apple were by no means penny stocks. The Apple IPO, for example, minted 40 millionaires and made Steve Jobs a centimillionaire. Throughout the rest of the century, the NASDAQ dominated the tech IPO scene, and they made groundbreaking progress within the financial markets. For example, in 1992, the NASDAQ partnered with the London Stock Exchange, which marked the first time that the capital markets of different continents were linked together. But unfortunately, as the millennium came to a close, so did the NASDAQ's positive reputation, at least for the short term. 
You see, in the early 2000s, we saw one of the most painful stock market crashes in history called the dot-com crash. Fortunately, everyday people weren't really affected by this crash and most of them didn't even know this took place. But if you were invested in tech companies, you got slaughtered. And given that basically every tech company you can think of was listed on the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ became associated with extreme speculation and massive losses. While this wasn't a great situation for the NASDAQ, they continued to push forward the financial markets by leveraging the internet. In 1998, the NASDAQ became the first US exchange to offer online trading. And the NASDAQ started using the slogan, the stock market for the next 100 years. The NASDAQ also started acquiring and partnering with a bunch of foreign exchanges, and they rebranded these as NASDAQ exchanges. This led to the rise of NASDAQ Copenhagen, NASDAQ Stockholm, NASDAQ Helsinki, NASDAQ Iceland, and so on and so forth. So, in the end, the company NASDAQ is simply a conglomeration of stock exchanges from around the world. But as we discussed in the beginning, this is not the only thing that they're known for. If people aren't referring to the company or the exchange when they say NASDAQ, they're likely referring to the NASDAQ indices. Similar to the S&P 500 and the Dow Jones, the NASDAQ offers a few indices that have grown to be quite popular. The two most popular NASDAQ indices are the NASDAQ Composite Index and the NASDAQ 100. People often get confused between these two, and their nearly identical prices doesn't exactly help with the situation, but there is a major difference. The NASDAQ Composite Index was founded alongside the company way back in 1971, and this index tracks all of the equity securities that are listed on the NASDAQ stock market, which includes over 2,500 stocks. Initially, the index was launched with a price of $100, and given that the NASDAQ Composite currently stands at over $12,000, we've seen a 120x return on this index since inception. For perspective, the S&P 500 has grown 42x during the same time period. Moving on to the NASDAQ 100, this is a conglomeration of the 100 largest non-financial companies that are listed on the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ 100 wasn't introduced till 1985, but given that it's not only filled with a bunch of tech stocks, but also that it doesn't include any of the slower moving financial stocks, I don't think you'd be too surprised to hear that the NASDAQ 100 has already produced a 100x return. But it should also be noted that when we experience a downturn, the NASDAQ 100 gets slaughtered. During the dot-com crash for example, the NASDAQ 100 sold off 83%. So, if you're looking to invest into the NASDAQ 100, you definitely need to be able to stomach some volatility. Anyway, the NASDAQ Composite and the NASDAQ 100 aren't the only two indices from the NASDAQ, though they are the most popular. There's also the NASDAQ Global Equity Index, the NASDAQ Golden Dragon China Index, the PHLX Semiconductor Index, the OMX Stockholm 30 Index, and so on and so forth. Moving on from all these indices, the NASDAQ also has their own stock. During the height of the dot-com bubble in 2000, the NASD decided to start selling their stake in NASDAQ. They started off with a private placement offering, and shortly after, shares of the NASDAQ started trading on the OTC markets. And eventually, on February 9, 2005, the company NASDAQ was listed on the NASDAQ stock exchange. The ticker symbol for the company is NDAQ, and they currently sit at a $25 billion valuation. Clearly, embracing the digital world has played out quite well for them. Alright, so the NASDAQ primarily rose to fame by embracing technology. First, they embraced electronic trading and then they embraced online trading. This attracted a bunch of tech firms to their exchange and this is how they became super famous. But nowadays, everyone has electronic and online trading. So why do modern tech companies continue to choose NASDAQ over the competition? Well, looking at it from a common sense perspective, would you want to list your stock on an exchange that has lagged in innovation or would you rather list it on an exchange that has led the curve? The answer is obvious, but innovation is not the only reason companies tend to go with the NASDAQ. Another major reason is cost. If you want to list 75 million shares on the NYSE, you're looking at an upfront $360,000 plus an annual listing fee of $71,000. If you're looking to list the same 75 million shares on the NASDAQ capital market, however, you will be paying a slightly higher annual fee of $79,000, but the upfront fee is significantly less at $75,000. At this rate, it would take 35 years for the NYSE to become the cheaper option. Something else to consider is that the NYSE also has more logistical requirements. For example, all companies listed on the NYSE must have an independent compensation committee and an independent nominating committee. NYSE companies must also have an internal audit function and corporate governance guidance. As you would guess, none of these factors are requirements with the NASDAQ. So, looking at cost, logistics, and innovation, NASDAQ is the easy choice to make. 
However, a select group of companies continue to use the NYSE over the NASDAQ for a few reasons, starting with prestige. As we discussed, the NASDAQ is often associated with extreme speculation and insane volatility, and this association puts off a lot of investors. Also, it should be mentioned that the NYSE goes out of their way to reduce volatility. According to the NYSE website, their exchange is 51% less volatile at the open and 52% less volatile at the close. So, companies that are less growth-oriented and more stable like financial institutions and insurance companies often choose to list on the NYSE over the NASDAQ. This natural divide has made the NYSE the go-to place for value investors and the NASDAQ the go-to place for growth investors. This doesn't really matter for the end user though, given that both exchanges are offered at basically every brokerage you can think of. At the end of the day, none of the components of the NASDAQ are particularly hard to understand. The reason that it's often confusing is simply because the same name refers to so many different things. It would have been way better if each of them simply had different names. But unfortunately, this is the system we have. First, there's the NASDAQ company which is in charge of handling the NASDAQ exchanges. Then, there's the NASDAQ indices which primarily include the NASDAQ Composite Index and the NASDAQ 100 Index. And finally, there's the stock of the NASDAQ company itself. Over the past few decades, the NASDAQ has proven to be a much more innovative exchange with much looser policies, which has made them a favorite amongst growth companies. But a lot of companies in legacy industries continue to prefer the NYSE, and that's the NASDAQ explained. If you were the owner of a multi-billion dollar company, would you list on the NASDAQ or the NYSE? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if you thought this video explained the NASDAQ well. And of course, consider checking out our international channels to watch our videos in other languages, and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.